Good evening, everyone. I'm Governor John Carney, thank you for joining us tonight. We apologize for the little bit of delay. We've, we're having some te technical difficulties bringing Dr. Reba Hollingsworth on. Oh, uh, you had to tell all of that. <laughs> she is, she's with us. She's on the phone and, and on the Zoom and she just commented that it's a lot of technology for a 95 year old. And I told her that we are blessed that she is with us, uh, with us tonight and with us always. She is just a, a real treasure for our state and also the co-chair of the Delaware Heritage Commission, who is the co-sponsor of tonight's Black History panel discussion, along with the Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs. We've got a couple great presentations for you, an amazing discovery recently on the John Dickinson Plantation. And of course, the purpose of our panel discussion and presentations tonight is to help bring public awareness about this discovery of a, a burial ground of uh, enslaved Africans at the Disc Dickinson Plantation. I visited the site myself with, with others, I gotta tell you, it was a powerful, amazing visit. I and others were speechless uh, as we just absorbed the importance of the discovery, uh, the reality of this burial ground and, and the lives that the enslaved Africans experienced there in the plantation. And we'll hear more about that, but just a very powerful and important discovery. And one, I think that uh, brings some, some of our difficult uh, parts of our history and makes it very real for us. And also as, 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 a, as a happy thing in a discovery of, of these uh, uh, enslaved folks uh, buried there uh, and lost for, for lots of years. And so tonight is gonna be a special presentation. It is one in our series of, of panel discussions that, uh, that we committed to have as part of our Juneteenth uh, celebration earlier this year in, in conjunction with the Heritage Commission and the Division of Cultural Affairs and other Delaware agencies. Uh, we are joined by Dr. Hollingsworth. You'll hear from her next. She is the co-chair of the Delaware Heritage Commission, former educator, professor at Delaware State University and beloved by all of us. Gloria Henry is the site manager for the Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs at the Dickinson Plantation, just a, a treasure herself, along with Annie Fenimore, the late lead inter interpreter there in the division. We also have Dr. Kami Fletcher, who's a professor of history at Albright University and a, and a real, real great resource for us. And we'll put some of this into a more, uh, a larger context, a, a national context and perspective. And then bring it back home with uh, Rita, Reverend Rita Page, uh, who is a pastor w w here in Dover with, and uh, with the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance of Dover, a group whose members I know have visited the site and uh, Dr. Reverend Page is gonna talk about her experience there. So I'm honored, uh, frankly, and humbled to be the moderator tonight, uh, my job is to keep my mouth shut and keep it moving with the other folks that are with us. Uh, and next up is uh, Dr. Reba Hollingsworth. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you for bringing the historical perspective that you always do uh, and for your co-chair uh, with the Delaware Heritage Commission. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to share with you some very interesting information about what I am calling hidden tre treasures that you will find at the Dickinson Plantation. Uh, there are hidden treasures throughout the, uh, the state of Delaware and I suspect throughout other, the United States, but right now we want to focus on those that are at the Dickinson Plantation. Um, and maybe we will find some relatives of mine and some of yours who might also be some ancestors for us who might be buried there. And with that, I suppose I uh, just welcome and join in the participation. And we will now be hearing from uh, Ms. Gloria Henry. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Hollingsworth. Okay. 
And we're gonna be starting the presentation. So my name is Gloria Hen Henry, good evening. I'm the site supervisor at the John Dickinson Plantation, which is an historic site that is administered by the Delaware Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs, which is a division under the Department of State. The John Dickinson Plantation is located south of Dover, Delaware, along the St. Jones River, and is the boyhood home of John Dickinson. He was one of our founding fathers. He was a governor of Delaware and Pennsylvania. He was a framer and signer of the U.S. Constitution. He wrote of freedom while holding men, women, and children in bondage. I would like to share with you some of the information we have researched about the people who lived, labored, and died on this historic site. I'd also like to talk about the plantation and about the discovery of the African burial ground. Next slide. Violet Brown was an enslaved woman who was owned by the Dickinson family. And she was eventually freed in 1786. In her recollections about the death of her father Pompey, who was also enslaved, she stated that there had been a funeral for him and that it had passed by the mansion house to the grounds allotted to the internment of the enslaved individuals. With those words, we in the division knew that there had been a burial ground on the property and more importantly, we were determined to find it. Next slide. The slide you are now seeing is showing you the land that the funeral possession would have had to travel to take Pompey and many of the other enslaved, indentured, and free Black men, women, and children to their final resting place. The burial ground was and is in a farm field about a half a mile from the mansion. We don't know when they began using the land as a burial ground. We don't know when they stopped using it as a burial ground. But we do know that it was used during the time the Dickinson family owned the land. Next slide. John Dickinson, well, I should say the John Dickinson Plantation was the boyhood home of John Dickinson. His father, Samuel, established this plantation using the labor of enslaved individuals. When John Dickinson's father died, he inherited property, which included an unknown number of enslaved individuals and the land we know of today as the John Dickinson Plantation. John began to expand the plantation and eventually owned approximately 5,000 acres in St. Jones Neck. Next slide. John Dickinson didn't live here. Not when he was full, fully grown as an adult. He leased the mansion, the grounds, his other nearby properties, and the enslaved men, women, and children to tenant farmers. And in exchange, he received money in the form of gold and silver, some of the crops that they grew, the corn, wheat, tobacco, some of the products they made, like candles, and some of the animals. Next slide. Some of the enslaved individuals were skilled. They were tailors, shoemakers, tanners, carpenters. John Dickinson rented the enslaved individuals to other people who needed labor and made them available to his tenants to help them fulfill their lease agreements. Next slide. John Dickinson owned men, women, and children for 26 years. In 1777, he enacted a conditional manumission. He decided to set free 37 enslaved individuals he held in bondage, but only on the condition that they continue to work for him for another 20 one years. For some people, that would have been a lifetime. In 1781, he unconditionally manumitted or set free six men and women and children. And we don't know why he chose those particular six people. And we don't know why he chose to manumit them at that time. But in 1786, he is deciding to free everyone. And he signs an unconditional manumission 
that released all the enslaved individuals from bondage. These individuals were listed in family groupings with the names of the men, the women, and then the children of, providing familiar connections. Some of the African Americans were employed by the Dickinsons. Some of the children were indentured to John Dickinson, and some of the seniors lived on the property and were not to be disturbed. But this did not end slavery at the John Dickinson plantation. Tenant farmers who leased lands from John Dickinson continued to hold people in bondage. Next slide. After 1786, the John Dickinson plantation was home to tenant farmers, tradesmen, free blacks, indentured servants, and enslaved individuals. John Dickinson leased his various properties to both white and black men and white women. Next slide. We know that people lived, labored, and died on this plantation. But between then and now, the exact location of the burial ground had been lost. So we began an investigation to find it. Next slide. Over the years, the division staff researched the Dickinson records, looking for and identifying any reference to death in a graveyard. Violet Brown's recollections were the most compelling, but other records referred to purchasing coffins, digging ditches and banks around a graveyard, and building a post and rail fence around a graveyard. Next slide. We hired Dovetail Cultural Resource Group and South River Heritage Consulting, and their archaeologists conducted additional research and began the field work. The exact location of the burial ground was discovered using information from the Delaware Federal Writers Project and historical aerial imagery, which dated from 1926 to 1961. The imagery showed a dark rectangular area within an agricultural field. And that was about a half a mile from the mansion. And that location matched the description described of the location described in the Federal Writers Project and in a 1950s historic sites survey report. This image that you're now looking at was taken from the vantage point of the African burial ground. You can see part of the historic house and reproduction outbuildings or recreated outbuildings in the distance. Next slide. The field work included ground penetrating radar, shovel testing, metal detecting, chemical soil sampling, and excavation. Trenches were dug, and on March 9, 2021, the archaeologists informed us that they had found the burial ground. What did we discover? we discovered that the site containing the African burial ground was acquired by the state in the year 2000. The size of the burial ground is 170 feet by 160 feet, which is under an acre. We found almost 30 grave shafts. We found post holes, burnt tree roots, and unknown anomalies. The grave shafts were or oriented from an east to west and some of the nail fragments were identified, and that might indicate that they were, there were coffins in use. No human remains were disturbed. Next slide. This slide shows the process of closing the burial ground. The archaeologists identified each feature and covered each grave shaft with geotech fabric to protect them. Then we filled in the trenches. Our research is continuing, and we are looking for the descendant communities of the men, women, and children who lived, labored, and died on the John Dickinson Plantation and the entire St. Jones Neck area. We are asking our Delaware community and other communities to engage with us, to share information with us, to help us make future decisions. Next slide. There are many questions surrounding the burial ground. Our work is not done. 
Decisions will have to be made and we want and need the community's involvement. We cannot and will not make these complex and emotional decisions alone. We have established an advisory committee for the John Dickinson Plantation, and that committee will assist with future improvements to site interpretation, inclusive history research, educational and public programming, and capital improvements. The advisory committee has discussed what, did discuss what to name the burial ground. There were so many questions about who was buried there. Keeping in mind the people buried there may have been denied the rights as citizens and may not have thought themselves as Americans. So after careful consideration, we decided to name it the African Burial Ground. Next slide. In 2020, the Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs published a race In 2020, the Division of Historical and Public, sorry, in 2020, the Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs published a race and equity statement. And we can go to the next slide. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I went ahead of myself, sorry. We stated that we would listen to the public and be a safe space for difficult conversations and uncomfortable truths. We want all voices to be heard. We promise to preserve and share Delaware history for current and future generations. To keep our promise, we need the help from the community. We need your help. Our initiative of ending erasure and recognizing African-Americans in the cultural landscape ensures that we share the multiple stories and perspectives of the black men, women, and children who lived, worked, and died on the plantation. We, the Delaware Division of Historical and Cultural Affairs, pledge to preserve the cemetery and remember and honor the men, women, and children buried in this sacred ground. They will never be forgotten again. Thank you. Gloria, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. <clears throat> Really uh, amazing, very difficult uh, conversations ahead of us. We did pass HB 194 to really clarify, you know, the legal uh, environment around the handling of remains such as this because the current law did not uh, speak appropriately to it. So we've got a lot of work to, and, and hats off to your team there if you could just give us a, a sentence or two about how long it took uh, to, I know there was a lot of research that w went into this and to discover uh, the burial ground there. So we've been working, I've been here for 30 years. <laughs> so we've been doing a lot of research and, and before my time and during our time, um, my time here. And um, it's been a dedicated effort within the last two years to to actually have uh, the archaeologists on site and looking for the burial ground. Very good. Next up, uh, we have Annie Fennimore. Annie, thanks for joining us. And uh, you have a slide presentation as well. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Carney. Um, good evening, everyone. I am the lead historic site interpreter at the John Dickinson Plantation. And um, the first image that I'm sharing with you is a look into the interior of the historic house at the John Dickinson Plantation. It's often called a mansion, and throughout my presentation I'll use both terms, historic house and mansion. Once you see the type of housing that the majority of 18th century Kent Countians lived in, you'll have a better understanding of why we call this building a mansion. This photo, this photo reframes a typical viewpoint. Often when people go to a historic site or museum, they look at the beautiful decorative arts, the expensive furnishings, and forget the human element. But this setting can't and shouldn't be separated from the people whose labor made such wealth possible. During tours of the site, we tell the stories of enslaved, indentured, and free Black people, of tenant farmers, and of the Dickinson family. Many lives were intertwined because of this place, and we want to recognize that. 
Research has been going on for decades, which is how we have everything that I'm about to share with you. Every document that's been examined offers a glimpse into the past, but each document is only a snapshot of a single moment in time. So we use as many documents as we can find to inform our understanding of the people who lived on the plantation or nearby. Next slide, please. One of the keys to understanding life on the plantation in the 18th century is understanding the institution of slavery. Enslaved people had no legal rights and were treated as property. That meant that enslaved people were bought and sold. They were leased out to do work and they were passed on in wills to beneficiaries. Enslaved people could also be freed, but that often depended on an individual's enslaver's decision to do that or not. The image that you're looking at right now is from one of those three manumission documents that Gloria talked about earlier. Um, this one specifically is the last one that he used to free all of the people he enslaved in 1786. In all three of the manumission documents he had written, the listing of people being freed included men, women, and children. In two of them, the names of the children were connected with at least one parent. And that showed us familial connections and is important to our ongoing research. Now, like Gloria, I do have to remind everyone that the final manumission John Dickinson put into effect did not end slavery at the Dickinson plantation or land holdings. Next slide, please. Now I would like to share with you some of the stories that have been uncovered through research at the John Dickinson plantation. Dinah was a black woman whom the Dickinson family enslaved. Flora, her mother, was also enslaved by the Dickinson family. They lived and labored on Dickinson lands. Dinah was a skilled spinner and was able to spin enough thread for herself and 10 other people. Dinah was among a group of enslaved people that Philemon Dickinson inherited at his father's death. Philemon then sold Dinah to another enslaver away from the Dickinson properties. Dinah and her first child, a daughter named Nancy, also called Nan, returned when John Dickinson purchased them. A note on that document mentions that John bought them at Dinah's request to prevent them being sold against her inclination to a person in Maryland. Dinah had three children, as far as we know. Their names are Nancy, James, and Cecilia. Dinah, her mother Flora, and her children are all listed in that 1786 manumission document. After that manumission, Nancy and James were indentured to John Dickinson, so they continued to work for him, and that was done with Dinah's consent. In November of 1792, we know for certain by that point that Dinah married Peter Patton, who was a free black tenant farmer leasing land from John Dickinson. In 1810, Dinah purchased check fabric from Joseph Barker's store. We believe that Dinah continued to live in the St. Jones Neck area, but her purchase at Barker's store is the last time we've been able to document her presence in the area. Next slide, please. Now I'll share with you a little bit more about Violet Brown, whose recollections Gloria shared a moment ago. Violet Brown was, um, she lived on Dickinson family properties as well, and her father named Pompey was an enslaved personal servant to Samuel Dickinson. Violet's mother's name is currently unknown, but Hopefully, maybe, we'll be able to uncover it with further research. At Samuel Dickinson's death in 1760, Violet was inherited by John Dickinson. Once John and Mary Dickinson had children, Violet worked as an enslaved nursemaid, and she was tasked with taking care of Sarah and Mariah. Violet slept in a room next door to the children's room and was expected to be on call throughout the night. We believe that Violet Brown was the Violet who was set free in the 1781 manumission that John Dickinson wrote. She was also listed later in the 1786 manumission. Later in life, Violet spoke to Sally Dickinson, John Dickinson's oldest daughter, about life at the plantation. Sally, also who I called Sarah earlier, wrote down some of Violet's recollections. Violet shared her memory of John Dickinson's return to the plantation from his studies in England. Violet also shared that Samuel Dickinson's death was so sudden that none of his sons arrived before it occurred. And then of course, 
One of her recollections describes when her own father, Pompey, died, that his funeral procession passed by the mansion on the way to the burial ground, and that Violet's mother then continued to live in the little frame cottage on the stream that supplied the milk house. I also think it's important to recognize that there is some bias in this primary source where Violet is describing these things to Sally and Sally is writing them down. Would Violet give the whole unvarnished truth? Perhaps, perhaps not. Would Sally write down everything that Violet said and not change a word of it? Perhaps, perhaps not. Now, Violet's death occurred in 1834. While that was the conclusion to her life, we are still sharing her story and um, are dedicated to continue doing so. Next slide, please. Now, John Dickinson's land holdings were very large, even larger than what we today call the John Dickinson Plantation. John purchased land across the St. Jones River, or not across, excuse me, along the St. Jones River um, in an area that we call St. Jones Neck or the Jones Neck. When he expanded his properties, he also had to find new tenant farmers or make agreements with tenants that were already on the land. Two of the tenants that he made agreements with were Peter Patton and John Furby. Peter Patton and his brother John Furby lived and worked in the Jones Neck area. They had been tenants of Nathaniel Luff. After John Dickinson purchased the Luff property, these two free black men continued on as John Dickinson's tenants. In 1801, the two brothers had a joint lease with John Dickinson. The agreement lasted a year and also required that brandy and cider be made from the orchard and delivered to John Dickinson. After that, the two brothers had different leases. John Furby was a tenant of the Dickinsons until 1812. He died a few years later, leaving behind his wife and six children who were then grown. Peter Patton stayed a tenant with the Dickinson family through 1810. By 1792, he had married Dinah, like I mentioned in her story. Peter Patton died in 1833. Two children were named when his estate was settled, Naomi and John Patton. Almost all of his property's value was in livestock at two pair of oxen. There's even more detail to the stories of these two free black tenant farmers who lived, worked, and raised their families on the Jones Neck. Next slide, please. We also know that Peter Patton lived in a house similar to this one, the, um, the log dwelling. This is the site's reconstructed log dwelling. The log dwelling and other outbuildings were thoroughly researched and replicated. And their construction in the 1980s was meant to shift emphasis away from the mansion and interpret 18th century life and agriculture in an area where a large percentage of the population involved in farming was African American. This one and a half story structure has a loft and no wood flooring or foundation. This building is representative of the kinds of houses on Dickinson property for enslaved people, free black people, tenant farmers, and anyone else who might not fall into one of those three categories. When whole families lived together in a building like this one, there was no privacy as we know it today. What's more, it's nowhere close to our ideas of modern comfort. It was hot in the summer, even if you could catch a breeze through the open door, and cold in the winter, even when there's a fire in the fireplace. So to help visitors understand how people lived in these types of structures, the log dwelling is furnished with reproduction items and furniture as documented in the time period. Next slide, please. Like both Gloria and I mentioned earlier, slavery continued at the plantation even after John Dickinson's manumissions. Deborah and William White were tenant farmers and enslavers who leased the mansion and surrounding acreage from John Dickinson in the late 1780s and early 1790s. In 1790, an advertisement appeared in the Delaware Gazette for one of the people William White had enslaved. It described a man named Clem who had sought his freedom and the advertisement offered a reward of $6 for his return. Included in that advertisement was a detailed physical description. Clem was described as being five foot four, five foot five, 35 to 40 years old, stout and somewhat hard of hearing. His clothes were also described all the way down to a pair of almost new shoes. At the end of the advertisement, a note was made that Clem might claim that he was one of the black people that John Dickinson had freed a few years prior while William and Deborah White remained tenants, the reward money was never claimed and Clem's fate is unknown. After William White's death in 1793, 
Nine enslaved individuals were listed on his inventory. Some were listed by name. After William White's death, um, Deborah moved to Upper Place and remained a tenant of John Dickinson until the time of her own death. To learn more about the stories of people who lived and labored at the plantation, some of whose stories I've shared with you, please come and visit us at the John Dickinson Plantation. Next slide. We are also sharing our research online through a list of names and stories that we are calling the Plantation Stories Project. This image is from how we are currently presenting the Plantation Stories Project online. Our mission is to share the stories of the people who lived, worked, and died at the site of the John Dickinson Plantation with emphasis on the stories of historically oppressed and marginalized people. Through the project, the site endeavors to give voice to people whose stories have largely been lost to time. And eventually, the Plantation Stories Project will become a listing of all documented information about named individuals. Um, this project takes a really methodical approach to searching through and cross-referencing documents, but it's also important to recognize that not all gaps can be filled in. We selected a handful of documents, reviewed each of the sources for any relevant information like names, ages, genders, and placed all of that information into a spreadsheet. Then we organized the list alphabetically. We cross-referenced those dates, ages, genealogy, and names to figure out where a single individual was mentioned. We found many people with the same first name, and in many cases, that's all that we had. When that occurred, we did our best to determine precisely who was mentioned in a certain historical document. So the Plantation Stories Project is part of a larger initiative that you saw on Gloria's slides titled Ending Erasure, Recognizing African Americans in the Cultural Landscape. As we continue researching and compiling information, we hope to be able to create and share narratives of people's lives. And this work has already made a difference in how the history of the site is shared. Next slide, please. If you would like to contact us, um, please do so. Uh, Gloria and I both look at jdpmuseum at delaware.gov. Uh, feel free to email us there or call the site at 302-739-3277. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Annie. Fantastic, really great uh, stories of those uh, enslaved people and tenant farmers who lived in and around the, the Dickinson Plantation really helped bring to life uh, what life was like around there for those folks. Thank you, Glory, and both of you for, for really giving us a great uh, snapshot of what's, uh, what we have there at the plantation, at the, the uh, Dickinson Plantation slash, slash mansion, and now with the, uh, with the burial ground there. Have des decisions been made about how to incorporate the burial ground into the plantation and mansion? Uh, for visitors, or is that something that needs to be decided? Not all decisions have been made. <laughs> We're in the process of talking about it, and we have other um, activities planned, um, such as um, a new trail, a new pathway system throughout the property. And so all of that will be determining how we can incorporate everything to make it as whole as possible when we're discussing and giving guided tours of the plantation. As we saw from, from the photos, it is, uh, you can see the house uh, from the burial ground and vice versa, but it is a little bit of a walk out to, into the field to, to see the burial ground. Next up, we're really privileged to have Dr. Kami Fletcher from uh, Albright College. Uh, we appreciate her bringing her expertise to us this this evening. Um, and she's going to put the, the burial ground, this discovery in some national context. And we appreciate her sharing her expertise tonight. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you to Governor Carney. Thank you um, to your entire staff and, and team. Um, and thank you to everyone at the John Dickinson Plantation. It's been awesome to work with Gloria and Bertie and Annie and Dan. Um, I'm, I'm happy to be a member of the team here. Um, so what I'm hoping to do in, in my minutes and sharing is talking about the importance of um, African burial grounds, right, in a, in a very general um, yet specific um, purpose here. Next slide. 
So to start off my presentation, um, I want to set it with a quote from Dr. Michael Blakey. Um, he was the forensic scientist that worked deeply, uh, that really led the team on the African burial ground in New York that was unearthed in 1989 that I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, but he wrote a preface, a foreword to a book entitled The Death Care Industry, African-American Cemeteries and Funeral Homes. And Hughes and Wright that wrote that book, um, I think it was early 2000s, looking at it now, but early 2000s, um, was on a quest to write about, preserve, restore, every African burial ground that they could find. And I think this quote is so fitting um, for us to think about this, the importance. And it reads, African-American identities are entombed, marked, fought for, preserved, celebrated, symbolized, mourned, and incorporated in the cemetery. And so this is not just a space. It's not just a place. Um, we're talking about African-American identity, right? So already that, that's a different positioning. Um, and we're talking about them being marked, right? They themselves um, are being used to describe themselves, right? Um, and the idea that they fought for this, right? This African-American identity. Uh, for the last 10 years, a little bit over 10 years, I've been doing research on Baltimore's Mount Auburn Cemetery. Uh, founded in 1807 by um, the earliest burial ground, founded by folks who founded the earliest African Methodist church in Baltimore, not AME. Um, and that, it, that was about them on a quest for burial rights, R-I-G-H-T-S. So when you look at this burial ground from 1807 that's still um, in, in action today, you know, this is about Black folks positioning the graveyard as a space to fight for freedom, right, to resist slavery. Um, and we're talking about preservation, preservation of this culture, and it's a celebration, right? This is not just about death. Cemeteries is very much about the life, right? This is how uh, those wonderful people, right, that Annie pointed out, that Gloria pointed out, this is how we know them because they have left, um, you know, their material culture very similar, we can all see this with Egyptian death culture. The reason why we know so much about this group um, is because um, death, and it's a symbol. This is a symbol when we have those hard histories, those hard conversations about white supremacy and black inferiority. In a place like Dover, a place like Delaware that I'll talk about more in a minute, people are like, there's slavery there? Yeah, there was absolutely slavery there. And there's absolutely a system of white supremacy that was established on the backs of black inferiority that folks resisted against, but we still have to talk about that. Um, and this is a place of mourning. So much about plantation public history now is sites where folks go and get married. There's, a, there's cognitive dissonance there, right? Um, and so John Dickinson is saying, this is a place to mourn folks that have lived their lives um, enslaved. Um, and incorporated these identities for, right? So this is something for us to think about. Next slide, please. Um, also, the importance of African burial ground is that this is national memory, right? We're talking about the signer of the Constitution, right? The penman of the revolution. These are spaces of national memory, but that memory has been jaded, it's been one-sided, right? Um, so we can now look, use this um, African burial ground um, to look at origins and identities. And here's four points. Number one, this burying ground helps to assert the African experience as foundational to understanding American history, not tangential, not marginalized. Um, right now, I'm sure you all have heard about, if you have not, I encourage you to go to Google right now. Um, in search, hashtag 1619 Project, that was started by Hannah Nicole Jones and the New York Times in August 2019. This was the 400 year anniversary of the first 20 and odd Negroes who landed on these shores. Um, and that was the shot heard around the world. Scholars, we were clamoring to get this in, in their syllabus. Um, in 2019, I thought the 400 year anniversary was going to go how it always goes. We're going to commemorate 
um, you know, some Pocahontas story, right? Some whitewashed Eurocentric colonial settler story. So my students and I, we went to Ghana to celebrate the year of return. Lo and behold, I come back to this magnanimous project that says 1776 is not the beginning of this country. It's actually 1619. And she's thus um, published a book. I encourage everyone to go get that. But that's the same thing that we're doing here. We're talking about the building of the country. All of these things that happened um, could not have, it could not have happened even what John Dickinson um, did without this wealth. He had an, he exploited people for their labor. He had a complete economic engine and he was able to go out and go to England and study and, and write up all these ideas, right? Because he had, he had this ex exploitative labor. Also, we need to think that this is slavery in the making of America. Um, James Horton, Ira Berlin, these are top scholars that study slavery, that study uh, the plantation complex. And there's a great four-part documentary that I encourage you to, to go watch, see the whole thing on YouTube, called Slavery in the Making of America. What does that look like? Well, we're not talking about that freedom is about, um, frankly, white people uh, asserting their freedom from Britain. But this is about a complicated freedom story where you're looking at the intersection of gender and race and ethnicity, right? What, what does that look like? Also, it disrupts the plantation narrative. As I said, there's a serious idea of democracy. There's a real progressive narrative that everyone here was fighting for the same freedom. I can tell you right now that Philemon and Dinah and all these people that Gloria and Anna talked about, they were fighting for a different freedom than John Dickinson was writing about. I can tell you that right now. Um, and maybe even the freedom that his wife was fighting for, right? So we have to look at the, the intersections there. Um, and when you look at plantation narratives, if you've ever gone to a historical plantation, um, you, there's a fascination with old colonial read white family, um, right? And, the, and this aristocracy, there, again, there's no um, real understanding how race and whiteness and, and white supremacy plays into that. And so this is a counter to the social erasure um, and ending this segregated knowledge and this benevolent history story. Like I said, um, there were, by 1800, there were, there were about 6,000 people enslaved in Delaware. That's a very low number when you look at Maryland and some of the other Southern states. And then the idea is that slavery wasn't that bad. It wasn't that brutal. It absolutely is. When you're keeping freedom away from anybody that wants to be free, which we all do, then it is absolutely brutal, right? So it disrupts that. Um, and it gives a more comprehensive American freedom story. And again, it foregrounds the idea that slavery did exist in Delaware. It was not abolished, even though we had these laws, 1787, 1797, that was pushing against enslaved people being sold out of the state. Slavery was still not abolished until 1865. Next slide. The burial ground remembers when we forget. That's really a powerful statement in what we're saying here. Um, the folks that have buried their people out there, they're, they're gone, it's gone, but that, that burial ground remembers that, right? Does death material culture matter? Um, African burial grounds, like any other cemetery, is a cultural institution. Um, and it, 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 it is also a discursive space that mirrors the unseen. And that's really powerful. We can say, when you go and you look at John Dickinson, it is such a serene space. A lot of historical plantations are beautiful, right? But that, plant, that burial ground reflects the brutality. It reflects the white supremacy, and it reflects the resistance, right, uh, from, uh, with, with, from these, these Black folks. Um, it's public memory. It's an important claim to public space when Black folks have none. Um, and there's an, an important idea of letting the bones speak. Um, I'll be talking about uh, Michael Blakely and, and his team in a minute, um, but there's a lot that can be learned from unearthing. And it's not just about DNA but what they were buried with, how they were buried with, all of those, those rituals um, can tell a lot about this community that, that they created. So letting the bones speak, hearing their voice, centering the African lived experience, um, 
learning about a life that does not center John Dickinson in this white Eurocentric slaveholding family. Um, learning about a non-Eurocentric story that starts with African cultural norms, African uh, beliefs, heritage, and ancestry, and how those folks decided what they kept during the, the slave trade, how they made and remade their life, and how they interacted with the very thriving indigenous community here, and also the, the Eurocentric, uh, the Europeans here as well. So we have to start with, with their stories and Black ancestors matter. Next slide, please. African burial grounds are America's roots. We, we have to understand that. Um, I'm not sure if you're seeing all the pictures. Um, yeah, okay, they're, they're coming up now. Thank you. Um, African burial grounds are America's roots. I'm sure many of you, if you're not, you can go look this up, are familiar with Alex Haley's roots, um, 1970, that has thus become, um, you know, LeVar Burton plays the role of Kunta Kinte, and in the book, he says that he has traced his family all the way back um, to Africa, and it was, it was, again, the shot heard around the world, a TV miniseries that they remade um, just a few years ago. That really coalesced with the founding of the African Burying Ground, where it's not just that Black folk were in search of our roots and who we are, but this was very pivotal to America's roots and understanding our complete comprehensive story. Next slide. So then um, here is Dr. Blakey, uh, the biocultural skeletal uh, biologist, director of the African Burying Ground um, in New York. And here's a quote. Um, that again, I'm pulling out from him. Each time we discover these ancestors of deep time, I love that phrase, our knowledge of who we were and our knowledge of how we came to be is enriched, right? Um, next slide, please. And so then him and his team, um, the story is thus. In 1989 in um, Manhattan, downtown Manhattan, a government building was going up. Um, at that time in 1989, um, when new construction is, is happening, if human remains are found, you have to stop construction and bring in an archeologist or an anthropologist. These laws vary state to state. Um, so they had to stop, human remains were found. And you know they didn't wanna stop because they were losing thousands if not millions of dollars a day and there was an outcry from these folks to say, okay, we just got to keep rolling. This government building has to go up. Um, and then when they couldn't do that, let's just dig them up really quick and put, put them over later. But things had changed. This was 1989. And there was a huge outcry by the Black community, um, non-Black allies. All you have to do is follow this in newspapers, as I have. My Angelo was, was quoted as saying something like thus, you could silence our ancestors but we will not be silent. Powerful, powerful thing that, that's happening here. Um, and what you see in the middle is a memorial um, that, that's there. I encourage everyone to go and, and visit. Um, I've been, I've taken students. Um, and so once this was the find of the century, 419 people were, were found. They were on earth. There was a huge, um, like I said, forensic, forensic, um, you know, research on this. So we knew, we know so much now about Black, the Black experience in New York. We would have never known this if that research hadn't, hadn't been done. Um, and so there was a fight for the remains. Columbia wanted, all of these big schools wanted it, but Howard University got it. Howard is one, arguably the, the most prominent HBCU in the country, historically Black um, university, um, and it was purposeful to have Black uh, scholars work on this. So Michael Blakey, Dr. Edna Green, and there's a three-part report. You can go and you can um, look at this. Um, on the, the slide, the picture to the left, my left, that's part three. Um, Edna Green really spearheaded the historical significance of this. And one of the things that I'll point out, not only are we talking about how they're buried, what they're buried with, we could tell the brutality of slavery in New York. When you tell people slavery exists in New York, they're like, what you talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Because it was abolished so early on in the 1700s, 
But one of the things um, that you'll see in this report is that how people die. And one, their, their back literally broke. There was a, a fracture that started at the top of their head and went all the way down to their tailbone, and they died. So if that's not brutality, then I don't know what is. So that's the types of things um, that we need to know, this hard history that we need to confront, um, you know, in, in our society. Next slide, please. Um, so then Black coalitions have, have really, really formed from this 1989 which I call like the Black Cemetery Movement, modern Black Cemetery Movement, right? It, it's really formed. Um, and at the beginning of, of, of this, kind of now in 2019, was the African Burial Ground Network. The idea, um, folks had to recognize that these sites are not protected. You know, every burial ground that's discovered is not on a wonderful historic burial ground with someone like Gloria Henry that's been working here for 30 years saying, I don't care what y'all say, I'm going to find this burial ground right? That's, that's just not the reality. They're paved over. They're under, um, they're on college campuses. They're just completely neglected, unmourned, unmissed. And so this um, law and other laws now like this are saying, we have to protect these places. They are absolutely national treasures. They're absolutely spaces that reflect who we are and our memory. And we have to throw money behind it to protect them in very similar ways that we've protected these rural garden lawn park cemeteries. Next slide. So then African burial grounds, like I said, were un unprotected, deemed unsacred, and so unimportant to American history, to American story, to American story that has drastically changed. Uh, last slide, please. And so you see people that are just not taking no, and I am, again, blessed to work with these folks as part of this Black Cemetery Coalition that's really popping up everywhere. Um, there's one that I'm working with, Gear Cemetery, East End, a lot of us on the East Coast um, have formed, and we are pushing back against um, the developers because that's what's happening. I can talk about this a little, a little later, but I'll just say this. As these burial as our nation developed right as cities grew as suburbia um was was organized as highways came through these burial grounds were completely unimportant as we're talking about the 20th century and so folks have organized and fought back against the developers that jim crow did not protect these spaces and so developers are saying well i own the land i can do what i want to do with it black folks are saying oh this is an issue of reparation no, I own this land because my ancestors are buried there. And so we're pushing back against that idea, well, who's an ancestor? It's not just about blood. I feel very connected to the folks that are buried um, at, at John Dickinson because slavery made it that way. Slavery created this black race. This, the, the, it, it was born of this, right, that we have this um, collective shared experience of, of suffering in a very, the very same way that it created white, right? So you can see on my screen here, um, there's an article about the descendant community. There's a wonderful virtual project at Gear Cemetery. Duke University has gotten involved. Good friends of mine, Aaron and Brian, that have been doing this work for so long at East End in Virginia. Um, and there's lots and lots of going on, lots of things going on. I'm excited to be a part of this work. Uh, thank you so much for allowing me to come in and speak. Really great, great information. Makes us feel especially lucky to have Gloria and Annie and the team at uh, Historical and Cultural Affairs for their persistence in finding this uh, so it wasn't lost. So we do have the opportunity to, as you say, let the bones speak. And because I'm looking at the quotes, the burial ground remembers when we forget and we won't forget now because we have this burial ground and it's our challenge to figure out uh, how to handle it, what to do with it, how to share the information there, and, and a, a big challenge. I know uh, Reverend Page joined many others, uh, uh, members of the clergy, in visiting the site. Uh, Reverend Page, thanks for joining us and sharing your insights uh, with us for our panel tonight. Hey, thank you, Governor. Good evening, everyone. Um, being out at the uh, Dickinson plantation and going to the burial site 
was really um, an amazing experience for me. You know, I, I immediately got on my phone and Googled to see when John Dickinson lived and saw it was from 1732 to 1808. And so I thought, wow, these people have been out here this long. What has taken so long to even discover them? Uh, from probably the mid 1700s to 1808 or whenever, we don't even know when they stopped. And then I wondered what they were buried in, how they were buried, whether or not there had been services um, you know, for them. I, I, I wondered about um, current dis, you know, descendants like who, who they may be. And, and then I started wondering, well, how many other places in Delaware may be burial grounds of, of slaves? And I started thinking about Lockerman Hall uh, at Delaware State University, because when I grew up on the campus of Delaware State University and Lockerman Hall was a place that was always forbidden uh, to go in by the children. I call us campus brats. Those of us who grew up on the campus, you know, young people, and we, we were never allowed to go into Lockerman Hall because we were told that it was haunted. Well, you know, if you tell children not to do something, sometimes we're going to go ahead and do it because you, have, you just said it was haunted. So we had to find out for ourselves and we went downstairs into, into the basement and we saw the, the slave um, cells, the quarters and the chains and everything. So that, made, so that took me back to that experience, wondering if there may be um, you know, a burial ground right on the campus of Delaware State University that we don't know about. Even where I used to work, the Delaware State Housing Authority down in the basement I think they used to house slaves. So it took me back wondering, okay, is there, are we going to do some more studying to find out where even where others are? Um, and I just think that Delaware has a lot of untold, undiscovered history, probably a lot of undiscovered rich history um, that, that will eventually be discovered and needs to be told and put uh, in, into the, the history books. And I am really hoping that uh, we can figure out some of the names of those who have been buried and maybe publicize it and see if descendants will come forward. And I am really praying that if that happens, that people will come forward and have the interest to to do uh, family history, so that we can take take this even further. But that was my experience with the John. B. I, I was just amazed. I, I just couldn't believe it that they had been buried that long, and and no discovery had been made. So you. So you, thanks for sharing uh, that experience. I, I just remember this wave coming over me of kind of the the whole reality of of the enslaved people who lived there as I looked at these graves and tried to wonder what these individuals, what these people were like, what the, the to try to think about the brutality, uh, Dr. Fletcher, of, of being in bondage and, and forced to, to labor like that to, for the benefit of of the Dickens and, and the tenant farmers that were there. Um, so we've got a, a series of questions and, and, and Reverend Page's last comment, I think goes right to this question about uh, how do we get the, what do we do next? How do we get the involvement of the descendant community? We did pass House Bill 194, which uh, states how unmarked human remains are to be responsibly handled and preserved uh, and includes the establishment of a committee with state and community representatives. Uh, how do we do that? Dr. Fletcher, do you have thoughts? You, you have to bring the broader 
a perspective to to the conversation. Do you have any words of guidance there for us? And then I'll, I'll go to Reverend Page and Gloria, and the folks there at the mansion. You know, I think we're doing it. Um, I think Gloria and our team are, are doing it now. You know, you are finding the name. Um, and as Reverend Page is saying, who do we know that that's buried there? We would have to get some type of association, um, right? We know the people live there, right? And then we can definitely make the assumption and say, if you live there, um, you possibly died there. Um, but I think there's something to be said, and we've talked about this, that this could have been a communal um, burying ground. You know, with Kid Tomic, the St. Um, Jones Neck. So we have to, you know, there's definitely other things. Um, I know for myself, I am involved right now in trying to learn more about the folklore, uh, the belief system that will then lead me to understand how they thought they would bury themselves. I've been looking at um, the type of material that they've been buying from the store and just seeing what connection um, that, that can be made um, but if we want to know more, the, the question, like you're saying, Governor Carney, is there. Do we unearth? Because um, I can tell you, we can read what happened with the, um, um, in New York, you know, with what they learned there. But I think that that's really um, a question that we have to um, have to think about. Yeah, I know we've heard from folks who say we shouldn't do anything. We should just leave them. These are, this is sacred ground. Others who say we should use technology, DNA, to try to connect with the descendant community. Gloria, I know you're going to help work uh, work through that with us. What 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 are your thoughts there? Well, as you know, I've been here a long time, and I I have thoughts on both sides. I I've read their stories. I'm still investigating them, and so part of me says leave them alone. They've been through enough, but the other part of me says I want to know more. I want to know about my ancestors. I want to know how they live. I want to be able to share their stories for current generations and for future generations. But we are looking for the descendant communities. In 2018, the National Trust um, for Historic Preservation's African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund and James uh, Madison's Historic Site Montpelier, they provided some guidance for uh, organizations working with descendants. And we've all accepted that now historic sites need to be engaged with descendants, the descendants of the people who were enslaved, not only at that particular site, but of the region, of the area, and also anyone else who, want, who has a connection or wants to be involved. Anyone in the community that feels this way, that we're expanding that definition of descendant community, and that is who we're looking for now to help us make these decisions. We can't make them alone. HCA, State of Delaware does not want to make them alone. We want to involve the community, the descendant communities, the whole community as a whole, and making these decisions on what to do next. Reverend Page, you know, I know, as I said, you, you visited the site with other clergy. Did you get any sense from the others that, uh, that you visited the site with uh, as to their feelings about how to, how to handle the, the future of, of this burial ground? That's a conversation that we actually need to need to have. I think we were just so much in awe to know we have not discussed that. I I did discuss uh, the last week with Reverend Geraldine Jones. She she and I had a discussion, and we were both talking about you know once names are found that they need to be published in in the paper so that so that people can come forward. I would think that there'd be considerable interest within the the African American community in in the state and particularly in the region to to see if there's a connective family connectivity through DNA, but obviously something we'll have to sort out. So 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 Dr. Fletcher, help us understand what we can learn from this uh, this burial site uh, here in, in our state. Obviously you've touched on it quite a bit in terms of the presence and the reality and the history of slavery and it's uh, it being part of uh, of the economic value, frankly, of, of folks like John Dickinson and other slave owners and, and of the country. What, what can we learn from, from this site and, and what should we be thinking about there? 
Yeah, that's a great question. I just want to add uh, one more thing to the previous question. Um, I want us to think, folks that are buried, think about this, folks that are buried on a plantation where they were enslaved, are they resting in peace? Are they resting in peace when we think about, um, you know, not disturbing them? Um, and there's, there's research, and I, I argue this too, that one of the reasons why the burying ground was not documented anywhere, it was just oral history, um, is that when you have research funerals during this early colonial time period, uh, white slaveholders would just insert themselves um, in very disconcerting ways, leading funeral processions and, and, and speaking at, at funerals for um, enslaved folks that have, had died in a way that distressed um, Black folks. So it was hidden because they didn't, they wanted it hidden, right? Um, but we have to think about, are they, are they resting in peace? There's so much to learn um, from this burial ground. You know, that's why I keep saying, um, letting the bones speak. Um, it, it, you really do center who they were. It's not just about labor. You know, it is not just about the labor that was extracted from them. It is just not the service that they did for white folks. You know, this is a life that they tried to create. Um, and so when you, when you look at burial, it's connected to their whole cultural system, their whole belief system. And that's really what I'm, I'm going to start engaging in. Um, I know Hampton University early on in the 1800s started collecting those types of stories. Um, these these beliefs, um, and that'll tell us so much about who they were, you know, what they thought. These enslaved people lived in a veil, as Du Bois said, and he pointed it out. We don't know how much of that story, um, it's an important story, right, but so much of it is filtered through, you know, the journals and, and again, white folks, not the burial ground. The burial ground is not filtered um, through this, this white supremacist lens in this way. And we are able to learn, um, you know, in my opinion, and, and other folks that do this work, the, the, their, um, their direct experience. Like, we're really able to get the memory that they wanted left behind. Yeah, Annie and Gloria, how, how do we, you know, great stories about uh, the people that lived there, slaved and, and tenant farmers and others. How do we, how did ordinary Delawareans learn more about that? How do you uh, learn more about uh, the names that you have on manumission documents and that type of thing? Really fascinating uh, information. And, and for me, really brings the whole site to life, makes it real. These are human beings. These are human beings that were brutalized, et cetera, et cetera. It's just so much more, uh, uh, so much more real when when you can put names and their associations and as uh, and the stories like the ones you told. Where can where can Del ordinary Delawareans you know get that kind of information? Obviously, coming to visit and 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 seeing and being part of your tour, but uh, where do, where do we find that information? So yes, aside from coming to visit us in person, um, they can also look for us online. Um, HCA's website, history.delaware.gov, has a drop-down um, menu that's visit. And on uh, the Don Dickinson Plantations page is a link to a list of enslaved and free Black people. That's, that's what we're calling the Plantation Stories Project. And as we do more research, we will be able to add to that and expand it and add to the stories that are already there. The research for the project is still ongoing and we will update the information as soon as is possible. We also post educational content on our Facebook page so the public can also find us there, the name John Dickinson Plantation. Gloria, you've been there for, you put your blood, sweat and tears into that site for 30 years and you're a, a great, a storyteller and host for those who've, who have visited. Uh, what does this mean to you? Uh, you you talked, touched on it a little bit. Uh, you, you, you knew this existed for a lot of years and intensely looked for it for the last two years. What does it mean and, 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 and how, should we, uh, how should we think about it uh, as Delawareans as a, as, as a place to come visit and understand our fuller history, a hard part of our history, frankly, and not a proud part of our history in, in, in terms of enslaved people, but enslaved people that 
to have a proud heritage, which is going back to Dr. Fletcher's point. Lord, I'll be honest. Knowing that it's been here and I've always wanted to find it, the staff has been fully vested and looking for and researching to find out more about the people that lived here. So when they called to let us know that it was there, it was very hard to go and see. It was very hard to experience. Every time we were taking guided visitations out to the burial ground this past fall, every time we visited, it brought home not just what we're reading about, but that these are real people with real feelings, with real lives, and we don't know enough about them. We want to share this information. We want the public involved. We're asking for volunteers to come out and help if they would like. We're asking for the general public to not only um, the descendant community to share their history but and their information with us, but we want to share and we want to diversify our collections, our state collections. So we're asking for the public to share their stories, their artifacts, their oral histories, their family research with us at the division. In essence, we're asking for your help in preserving um, and sharing the stories for current and future generations. So for me, it is a labor of love. <laughs> it is a labor of wanting to know more about the people who lived here. Well, thank you I would think much. that would be for everyone to want to know more about the people who have gone before us and to learn these lessons in this. Well, thank you very much for putting your love into th that labor. It uh, obviously comes through to anyone who, who visits the site. Uh, as I said uh, at the top when we started, uh, the day that I visited the site with the first group, I think, that went out there, it was a very powerful, I, I think everyone was caught speechless. They didn't quite know how to deal with it because something that was something we read about in history books, we knew about, it was conceptual became very real, you know, it became these are human beings with feelings that were brutalized and, and all of that that lived and worked here be, uh, against their, their will it was really a very, very strong. And I think, for me, I think that's the value, right? Uh, you know, part of our uh, securing the future is somehow reconciling and, and understanding the reality of the past, which we're not often uh, willing to do. Dr. Hollingsworth, uh, you have been co-chair and our co-chair of the Heritage Commission and uh, just a treasure for our state and, and all the history that you bring. Could you close us out with some thoughts? And we appreciate again, uh, you being on the phone and on our screen <laughs> and the technology for uh, uh, someone 95 years young, you're doing great. Let me just tell you, we should all be smart. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I, I want to just repeat again the importance, I think, of involving the Black churches uh, and the members of the Black churches as, a, as perhaps a way of helping to identify those people who are buried in all of the cemeteries because most of the Black churches have some records of who was buried there and and uh, some of them may even be able to lead to the slaves as well as the free men. So, uh, and, and I have found, found out tonight that the, uh, there is something in the state of Delaware called the Delaware State Cemetery Association by Black ministers. And so that may also be a, 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 an area that we might look at as a means of helping to identify because so many people who are still here uh, are people whose uh, ancestors <laughs> were here. And uh, we've gotten a lot of people who, for instance, me, you know, my, my, my mother's people actually grew up right across the river from uh, the Dickinson Plantation. And when we visited there before, we found somebody with the name of Scott, which is my, their maiden name uh, for that family. So it might well be that some of my free uh, relatives, ancestors would be buried there as well. So if we just look at the records um, and also the census records too and, and see if we can find information that will be helpful. 
Well, Dr. Hollingsworth, thank you again uh, and the, to the Heritage Commission, Dick Carter and the rest of the members. We appreciate it very much. Uh, Gloria and Annie, thank you for your great work there at the Dickinson Plantation Mansion and all our colleagues at the Division of uh, Historical and Cultural Affairs. We appreciate uh, your work. Uh, Dr. Uh, Reverend Page, I always want to call you Dr. Page, uh, I guess for your sister and your, and your, your late father. We appreciate you being part of this discussion. And uh, Dr. Fletcher, thank you very much for, for joining us. Uh, from Albright College. We appreciate you bringing a broader perspective to this, this discussion, Thank this you. panel discussion of uh, African-American history in our state uh, and the history, the discovery of the burial ground of enslaved Africans at the John Dickinson Plantation. To those who've joined us, thank you very much. And we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. <laughs>